All right, and I'm going to go live on Facebook. And let me know when we are live there. Okay. Preparing the live stream now. Okay, going live. All right, great. Welcome, everybody. Hi, my name is Barb Cardell. I'm PWN USA's training director, and we want to thank you for joining us um, either in person on Zoom or over Facebook Live for this webinar today. Uh, this is our National Women and Girls HIV AIDS Awareness Day presentation and webinar. And we're going to be talking about healthcare. We're going to be talking about why healthcare is so important for our communities, for women living with HIV, and how we are hoping that people will sign on to pay special attention to healthcare in the upcoming election and will pledge to be a healthcare voter. Um, March 10th is our National Women and Girls HIV AIDS Awareness Day, and we want to talk about the best solution for ending the epidemic and especially ending the epidemic amongst women. And here's a hint, it does not include uh, encouraging people to use more condoms or shaming people about their sexuality. Um, instead, what it is, is it's talk, we end the epidemic by talking about giving people access to healthcare, especially women with HIV access to healthcare and women who are vulnerable to HIV. We believe, and part of our conversation today is going to be that we believe that the single most important intervention to combat HIV uh, among women in the United States is to provide quality health care and treatment for women and girls who are living with HIV. And we especially believe that universal health care, which is health care access for everyone in the United States, um, is the most important way to move this forward. The health care needs to be affordable, accessible, it needs to be non-stigmatizing, it needs to be culturally relevant, it needs to be non-discriminatory, it needs to be high quality, and it needs to account for our needs as whole human beings. So thank you so much for joining us today as we talk about healthcare, as we talk about especially how you as advocates, as allies, as partners can uh, include HIV conversations and healthcare conversations as you are going out and doing presentations around National Women's Girls HIV AIDS Awareness Day. The fuel was just expressed today. This webinar is being recorded and it is on Facebook Live. Um, everyone on the webinar will be in the attendee mode and your phone will be muted. If you have a question, go ahead and just click that little raise your hand button and we will go ahead and get to you so that you can ask a question rather than having to type it out. Um, or you can just go ahead and post a question in the Q&A box. If you're on Facebook Live, Tiami is gonna be uh, keeping an eye on that. And if there are any questions, she'll go ahead and bring those into our conversation as well. Um, this is the most important part is that we wanna make sure that everyone feels comfortable talking about um, HIV, talk about healthcare, and talk about the importance, especially for um, us as a community as we move forward. We'll have time for questions at the end as well if you did not get a chance to ask your question as we were going. Our presenters today are going to be Tanya Pradia from Texas, Roxanne Glapian, uh, Tiami Luckett, Nana Kana, and myself, Barb Cardell. And I'm going to turn it over to Tiami. Hello, just going to do a quick run over the in agenda for today. Um, go over the welcome in our introductions. Um, next, we're going to go into National Women and Girls HIV AIDS Awareness Day, what that means, um, followed by the importance of healthcare. Um, and then we're going to shift the conversation into how do we as 
advocates, how do we talk about universal health care, right, in different settings? Um, and then we're going to uh, bring the discussion in with like what it means to be a healthcare voter in 2020 um, and then open it up for discussion. So um, there will be a question and answer period at the end. And here we have our mission, um, which is to prepare and involve women and people of trans experience living with HIV in all levels of policy and decision making. And you'll see this article written by Wahida that's, uh, where the title says, we will control our own destinies. We are the Positive Women's Network, United States of America. But what does that mean, right? And how do we come together? So, um, um, I'm going to give you that information here right now. How we came together was that um, there were 28 diverse women who came to get women who were living with HIV who came together in 2008, right? And their ages ranged from 18 to 73. And in all of our intersectionality, um, we came together and we understood that we were not in this fight alone, right? That none of us were actually fighting alone. And so as we felt our strength and we recognized our worth as women, what we did was we actually seized and created opportunities for ourselves for the upliftment of not just our circumstances and our conditions, but the upliftment of women, all women, right? And so we mobilized to form and challenge systems and governments that could not, would not, or simply were not responding to our needs as women. And so how do we do that? We educate ourselves and we fight for our own causes and we build coalitions that strengthen our positions. Next slide. What do we do? We build leadership. We, we work under four principles, building leadership, analyzing and advocating on issues impacting people living with HIV, as well as organize and mobilize. And we change the story and who's telling it, right? So we're no longer grounded in this victim theory, right? We, we empower ourselves so that we can be victorious in our many battles, right, that we're facing. And so um, our work is definitely grounded in racial, gender, and economic justice. Next slide. All right, coming back to me. So welcome to PWN and welcome to our webinar about National Women and Girls Day. Um, so National Women and Girls HIV AIDS Awareness Day has been around since 2005. This is the 15th year that it's been celebrated. Uh, and it was really originally um, brought into being to highlight the fact that women and girls living with HIV um, were not often a part of conversations. We know this. Um, from our PWN founding that happened three years later. Um, and so as we talk about the 1.2 million people living with the HIV in the United States, it's estimated that one out of every four is a woman who is living with HIV. So while we appreciate our federal partners and the CDC for holding these national days, oftentimes the messaging is more around prevention, which we feel is very important, but we also want to make sure that messages living with HIV are also included in this message. So we, while we, uh, you know, indeed talk about um, not all women and girls with HIV are getting the care that they need, that is very important. That is the biomedical response. And with PWN, we want to actually go and look at the root cause analysis of why women might not be getting the care they need, how we can increase that, that, increase that access, how we can destigmatize HIV care and demand even quality health care in the process. So thank you for National HIV Women and Girls, or National Women and Girls HIV AIDS Awareness Day. And we take it just a bit further because that's just the way that PWN rolls. So I want to talk a little bit before we get into our more detailed conversations about why is healthcare important? Why is it important to women living with HIV? And why is it just important to our community in general? Other than a really cute pug who's wrapped up in a blanket, which I love this picture. Um, you know, when we talk about healthcare, it's very important to know that healthcare is not just something that you access when you're sick. Um, but instead, healthcare should be a comprehensive program that takes care of people, takes care of women throughout their entire life, throughout their entire reproductive life, life schedule, um, and in all aspects. Um, that it is about preventative care, that it is about 
holistic care that takes care of the entire person. So we're talking about dental health, we're talking about mental health, we're talking about physical health, we're talking about all sorts of preventative tests and vaccinations and everything needs to be included in healthcare. Healthcare should not just be when you're feeling sick. That should be when um, <clears throat> you can go to a doctor and not have to worry about it. But really, we want to talk about healthcare as being the whole comprehensive um, approach to wealth, health, and well being, not wealth, because that is contraindicated sometimes to so health and well being as we are moving through our lives. So the history of healthcare in the United States is actually really interesting and it goes back to sort of how we are. We are uh, one of the few uh, countries that does not have a universal healthcare system. And part of the reason for that is our staunch belief in capitalism. We believe that the market will supply what we need um, and that it will be affordable because if it's not, then people won't have access to it. Um, but what we need to realize is that uh, this is great if you have a job, if you have a well-paying job, but if you do not, then we're kind of going back to the early 1900s when there were doctors and your quality of care depended on how wealthy your family was. So if you were wealthy and you lived in the city, you actually could get decent medical care for that time. They would come to your house. They would bring uh, medication with them, and that was pretty darn good care. However, if you were someone who was living in poverty or living in rural areas, you did not have good quality healthcare access. Um, you could barter with a local doctor, perhaps for care, um, or you would rely on home remedies um, and, and perhaps see someone who was an elder who had a history of being able to treat a lot of illnesses, but there was not a comprehensive level of care that everyone in the United States was able to access. And so if you look at the life expectancy for people, wealthy privileged folk who lived in urban areas um, had a pretty good life expectancy. People who did not, did not have a very good life expectancy. And so as we come into the uh, 20th century, the 1920s, you know, really what we're thinking about is um, our access to health care and, and how that changed. And I've been doing a little bit of research and it's actually really fascinating to think about how health care looks. Um, there was a group that was a group of teachers out of Baylor University who um, after World War I decided that they wanted to ensure that teachers were able to have access to health care. They realized that the increasing cost of health care was out of the reach of many people. And so these teachers came together and they um, paid about seven cents a month for access to health care um, so that they could continue to receive that care and continue to work. The challenge was is that it only related to hospitals. And so um, if they needed medical care outside of the hospital setting or they weren't sick and wanted to do something preventative, that didn't actually um, cover them. So in the, when the Great Depression hit in the 1930s, um, health care became more of a heated debate. We had a number of people who were moving from rural areas into urban ones, and you would think that that would create a conversation around this perfect climate for compulsory health care. Unfortunately, it didn't. The conversation was more about um, unemployment and old age benefits. So as we talk about the, the process of healthcare and we look at it, you know, really pretty much we had this um, dichotomy. We had people who with wealth, who had great access, and we had people without wealth who did not have access. Um, after World War II, there was the Stabilization Act of 1942, which was an effort to fight inflation. And it sounds like it's a little bit of a nerdy kind of policy thing to talk about, but it's important because this was the beginning of when businesses started to offer health insurance to its employees because they weren't able to raise wages to um, actually compensate their employees or to keep them. They were able to offer benefits instead. And that is how we started coming up with um, health care that was offered for our, yeah, for, for our, for our employers. 
Um, this partnered with the Social Security Act of 1935, which provided uh, support for people who were unemployed or disabled, started to provide this kind of social support network that um, is beginning to think to see where we're at now. Um, again, though, as we're talking about these groups, the people who are left out are the ones who are living in poverty, who are underemployed or unemployed, and that continued to be an ongoing challenge. So when we get to uh, the 1950s, all of a sudden there's these great advances in medical science. Um, we had uh, the effective polio vaccine. There was the first organ transplant. So during this decade, we had great strides in medical care and the cost of medical care doubled. And so we start seeing this uh, you know, increasing cost as well. So now we talk about access and now we're talking about cost. So in the 60s, um, basically the national health expenditure, which measures how much nationally is spent as a part of the GDP, the gross domestic uh, product, percentage of uh, product, yes, that accounted for about 5%, which now it's close to about 17%. So when we talk about healthcare and healthcare costs being out of whack, that's what we're really talking about. And I promise, this is the only historical nerdy part of our entire webinar, but we kind of wanted to give people a background about how we got here, because otherwise it's so easy to think that it just sort of hatched last year or within the last 10 years, when really this has been healthcare and unequal access has been a firm part of the United States from really pretty much the beginning. And again, it's about wealth and power and about um, urban versus rural and definitely uh, northern versus southern. So this, so finally in 1965 the Social Security Act was passed and this was by President Johnson and this is when we finally got Medicare and Medicaid and we have Medicare that takes care of our elderly, Medicaid that takes care of our lower income disabled folks. What we had though was a great health insurance uh, system but people just couldn't afford to buy into it and there were a number of people who were being excluded because as these premiums were offered, they became more and more expensive. And so if you had a health condition, or if you were older, or if you were a woman and going to be pregnant, it was often seen as you were being one of the high-risk populations that were more expensive. And so your premium could, or you could be uh, actually denied coverage. So when we start getting into the 1990s, we start seeing Clinton, uh, President Clinton starting to try and address this. And so he had, in 1997, um, really worked on the Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, which is HIPAA, which we all know about, which talks about people being able to have better healthcare coverage, better privacy as well. And at the same time, he also implemented the CHIP programs, which is the Children's Health Insurance Programs, which is part of Medicaid assistance. So we're seeing that we're trying to provide the support. And um, as we can also see, it's getting more and more expensive. Um, in 2010, President Obama uh, drafted the landmark Affordable Care Act, um, which was very, very complicated. And what that did was it guaranteed that everyone would have access to health care. States that either expanded access or for open markets so that people could purchase it. They gave people support who were able to afford it. Problem, very complicated. And so they tried to roll that system out over a number of years. And in the process, it gave conservatives and people who felt that healthcare was not a right that everybody needed to have an opportunity to dismantle it, either through challenges at the district court level or even at the Supreme Court level. And that unfortunately is where we're at right now is that the ACA is under attack. We just heard last week that the Supreme Court has said that they will actually hear the validity of the entire ACA um, probably next year. And so when we talk about our healthcare access, we really wanna make sure that we're not going back to those 1920s when um, wealthy people had healthcare and the rest of us did not because um, you know most of the time, People would barter things like chickens, and I don't have a chicken to be able to trade for my HIV medications, so we need to figure out what we're gonna do before we get there. 
So thank you for bearing with me while we did a little bit of a, the history. That's often a part about um, how we got here that we don't often talk about. And I think it's kind of important um, to think about policy and also the historical perspective. Hopefully you agree. So when we talk about women living with HIV, what we talk about and, and what we demand and what we deserve is affordable care, comprehensive care that takes care of all of our needs, high quality care that we can go see a doctor or an other care provider who meets our needs, who we feel comfortable talking about our lives, that we're not stigmatized or judged, that there's not discrimination for however we show up, that we're not discriminated if we are a person of trans experience, that we're not a person who's uh, discriminated against because of our sexual orientation, or that we're not discriminated against because we're women living with HIV and we've seen cases of all of that happening. So we demand that there's no discrimination in the access to health care and that it's a total wraparound care as we mentioned that it's holistic, that it's like from the top of our heads uh, all the way to the bottom of our feet and everything in between for our mental care, our dental care, substance use recovery, uh, and all of everything else that we can think of including comprehensive reproductive care which is needs to continue have the full continuum of care that's provided. So health care, what does it look like in the United States? Unfortunately, this mess of a slide is what our health care currently looks like. Some people have private insurance, some people have Medicaid, some people have Medicare, and they have um, bought supplementary programs that either really help improve their care or sometimes they're just really expensive. We talk about administrative waste and prescriptions and uncompensated care. And really pretty much when we think about why our head aches when we think about healthcare, this is exactly why, because it's kind of a mess and there's a lot that's going on. But not to worry, because we have a um, you know, idea about how we can really change this in partnership with our, our elected officials and our policy partners to make this so that it meets our needs and meets the needs of our communities. So just a reminder, we are paying the most. On average, uh, in 2018, it was $10,586 per person in health expenditures in the United States, which is just about half of the other uh, conglomerate of um, industrialized countries. So we are paying the most for really the worst care that we can get. And I think it's important to say that the U.S. spends the most on drugs, uh, which is more than double the average of similar countries. And when we're talking about getting the least, this is what we're talking about. We have the second lowest likelihood of seeing a doctor when we need one. The United States uh, has the worst avoidable mortality or death rate, uh, considering, especially considering how much we spend on healthcare. We have one of the highest maternal, so mothers when they're delivering their children, highest maternal death rate um, in, in an industrialized country, and it's actually increasing. And we know that this impacts women of color, in particular African-American mothers, more than any other uh, group in, in this breakdown. And finally, as we're spending so much, um, the U.S. has one of the lowest percentages of people with health care coverages. So when we're talking about this being a problem, this is a true systematic challenge that we really need to continue to address. So as we look at this, yeah, this is indeed, you know, a word salad kind of slide, but what it tells us is that, you know, basically everyone in the United States or most people in the United States, especially most people that we know, are one serious illness away from bankruptcy. Um, and that is not the way it should be. For the middle class, basically health insurance is offering us little protection at great expense. And so we need to figure out how we're going to change that. And unfortunately, one quarter of every U.S. health dollar is wasted. So it's not as if we're spending all this money and getting really great care from it. It is, a yes, as, as we see in the chat box, it is a human rights disaster. So here is the solution. 
which is you know single payer universal health care and this is one of the you know key policy platforms that pwn stands on and we talked about single payer universal health care being so important because it is uh you know enabling businesses and people and government to go ahead and fund health insurance and reimburse doctors and and so in a way this is kind of a leveling out um that we pay premiums that the government actually works together and that everyone is covered and it's really simple um so how do we get there that's a really great great question and it's kind of complicated so when we're getting to universal health care there's a couple of different systems that we can talk about and they are really really complicated but also super you know important to think about we have regulated systems and we've got the two-tier system which is what they have in australia which mixes the public and private and we've seen some uh you know people talk about this recently and we have the single payer but here's what i'm going to tell you is that we're not going to talk any more about those complicated single payer systems today instead what i'm going to do is i'm going to recommend that you go to the pwn usa policy 101 webinar that they held in january it was fantastic and Kelly and Brianna, who are both our, you know, from our policy department at PWN, did a master job about talking about these different systems, why some people prefer one, why some people prefer another, um, and, and what might actually look like as we put it together for the United States. Um, and so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tiami to talk about our universal health care. Or would Tiami, would you like me to do this one? I can go ahead and go. Yeah, so when we talk about universal health care at PWN, as you can see our vision, um, our vision are all women living with HIV will have access to high quality, culturally relevant, non-stigmatizing and affordable health care and services to achieve emotional, mental, and physical wellness, regardless of sex at birth, race, immigration status, or ability to pay. It is important for us to notice and to acknowledge that healthcare for women living in the H with, with HIV in the United States is delivered through a patchwork of, of systems, and that more than half of the people living with HIV rely on the Ryan White programs for medical and associated services. We have a vast need and we need to think about how we're gonna go ahead and meet it. So for PWN, our vision reflects the critical need to defend, protect, and build upon the progress of the ACA, not dismantle it, but to support it. And that includes advancing real universal health care. And so for these reasons, really pretty much when we talk about our advocacy at the federal level, we're talking about creating a federal single payer health care system. That's that pretty simplified flow chart that we talked about maintaining and fully funding Ryan White uh, and the care programs that it supports, expanding access to health care for all, uh, especially immigrants, uh, regardless of their immigration status. And if states have, this, have a part in this process as well, and so at the state level we're talking about really expanding the statewide single-payer health care plans, expanding Medicaid to every state, so those 14 states that have not expanded, we want to go ahead and advocate that they expand those from their uh, legislators and state level, and that there is an and that uh, we really oppose additions of any requirements on people who participate in Medicaid, especially the work requirements or documentation requirements. So I'll stop there and see. Um, Tammy, have you been keeping an eye on the questions? Do we have? Any questions that I need to answer before we move to our next part? None in the Q&A. Um, you've been really good on the chat and I'm monitoring um, Facebook Live. All right. We do have a question in the chat. Um, Barb, do you know how premiums for those not on government funded care in the single payer model? Are, are determined. How they're determined? I actually don't. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and see if I can take Kelly off. Uh, Kelly, who is our policy uh, and legal fellow 
I'm going to see if, um, hey, Tiami, I can't take her off of, off of um, mute. Can you go ahead and promote her to a presenter? Okay, hey, can you all hear me? Yes. Sure can. Okay, awesome. I'm outside, so I apologize if there's noise. Is it too loud? No, we can hear you great, Kelly. Okay, great, great, great. Um, yes, so that is a really, really good question. And unfortunately, I'm not gonna have a satisfying answer for you because it's gonna be it depends. Um, it depends on the plan that you're looking at, and it depends on the nation that you're looking at. Um, what I can tell you is that there are plans out there and there have been bills proposed that would actually um, eliminate premiums for people under a single payer model. What it would happen instead is a single payer model would be paid through taxes. Um, so it depends on what you're looking at, but I encourage you to check out uh, our universal healthcare webinar because that talks a little bit about funding and who would be covered and how much they would have to pay in to get a little more information on that. Great. Thank you, Kelly. And we also got an answer from Nana in the chat box that said that it depends on the on the model. So that is definitely something that will probably be, um, you know, determined and we can certainly go ahead and steer you to some resources as well if you would like. So with that, thank you, Vanessa. Really appreciate the question. So with that, um, at the bottom of the slide, you'll see that we have our PWN Universal Healthcare Fact Sheet. And we'll go ahead and put that in the chat box so that you can go ahead and download it. Um, and moving on to the impacts of women uh, living with HIV. You know, when we talk about access to comprehensive and quality health care, we want to make sure it's affordable and we want to make sure that it is really um, addressing stigma that is present in medical settings. Um, and as we increase access to health care, we know for a fact that it will impact the late diagnosis, um, which often impacts women living with HIV. Um, it will help support complex medical care. And one of our most important things, especially as um, you know, members of community and members of families, is that it will um, hopefully limit, because our, we won't have to choose between um, medical care and family necessities. And we all know that those unfortunate um, and really difficult times where we've had to choose between our medication and paying rent. And unfortunately, um, in this current system where healthcare is so expensive, that is um, often a decision that, that people need to make. And that is really um, impossible. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Tiami. Thank you so much, Barb, um, and thank you, everyone. Um, here, we want to talk about like moving the idea of universal health care from our brains to our hearts, right? And how do we do that? And so um, more often than not, we as advocates, we're worried about um, talking about complicated issues because, you know, we're worried that we're going to get the facts wrong or that we're not the experts, right? And where we learn to actually get the message across is through making that personal connection because we can tell our stories as they relate on personal experiences. We are the subject matter experts on how HIV, on how uh, being trans, on how healthcare or lack thereof impacts our lives, right? And so when we talk about um, such important issues such as universal health care. When we talk about it on a personal level, then people are able to relate to that, right? Um, and we're not leading with actually the problem, we're leading with values, with shared, shared values that we have as people, right? Um, next slide, Barb. So, how do we actually talk about health care? Some, tip, some tips and tricks. First, you don't get lost in the jargon. As I was saying, you can talk about healthcare um, with elected officials in the same way that you talk about healthcare with your friends and with your families or what you've experienced in your own family, right? Um, with family members who have had like certain issues or maybe it was yourself who had an issue, right? Um, I have a pre-existing -pre condition and I can talk about how um, having the Affordable Care Act and having the Ryan White program, how like that helped me on my journey when I did not have health care by any other means, right? Um, and there we can share only what we're comfortable with sharing. Um, we, we don't need to remember terms sometimes like 
two-tiered system, government regulations, mandates, right? Um, we can just talk about it like from a hu one human to another, right? So you know your audience, you have to know your audience. And like I said, you can always talk to your friend um, and share your personal story that way, right? Um, and have a strong ask for the action, right? So um, just to say that like, one thing that you can choose to talk about or not talk about is like mental health or substance abuse and how that impacts how you see it, like members in your community, right? Um, next slide, Bart. And now we're gonna actually shift the discussion over to Tana. So Tana, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to introduce yourself um, and like we're gonna have like a guided discussion um, in, in, in this next little part, okay? Okay. Hi, my name is Tana Pardia and I live in Houston. I am one of the co-founders of uh, the Greater Houston chapter and I am also a board member. Thank you, thank you, Tana. So the first question that we're gonna start with is, how do you actually like start a conversation about healthcare? You know, I just recently had a conversation about healthcare. Um, I had someone call me and uh, a person that just found out that they were living with HIV, uh, they didn't know what to do. So I asked the question, did you have health care? And their answer was no. So my train of thought went to, I need to set you up where you can go for free to get care. Mm -hmm. uh, it just depends on the setting itself when the conversation comes up. Okay. And to make that person like open up, do you share any part of your story that you emphasize more and how important it is to access health care? For me, I have shared my experience of having my insurance lapsed uh, and not having insurance, but that came about me choosing the wrong plan that was not for me that uh, didn't allow me to go to the doctors that I needed to go to for my HIV. So I was with an insurance plan that did not help me, but actually hurt me in the long run. So in my advocacy, I tell people to really watch what plans that you choose. And I direct people to where they need to go for help. Okay. Okay. So that was like the answer to my next question. Like, what is your ask? But you were like, you, you want to make sure that people pay attention to the plans that they're choosing. Um, yes. What we do know is that the insurance um, healthcare here in the United States is so fragmented and it's so frustrating. It can really, really be frustrating. And um, oftentimes like we don't just pay attention to what we're reading because there are so many things thrown out at us through these policies. Right. But it is important to look because this is gonna affect you. And, and, and yeah, so thank you for that. Um, now, what would you add, especially when you are talking to elected officials versus someone who perhaps reached out to you? Well, when it comes to elected officials, one thing that I do, the first thing I ask is, what are your stands on healthcare? Uh, what are your stands on reproductive rights for women? What are your stands on abortion rights? So if you don't believe in my values and what women need, uh, I give them a personal history of myself mm -hmm. when I'm talking to them. And I ask the question, what would you do if you were in my shoes and you didn't have health care? Yeah. as an elected official yeah and that goes back to what i was just saying you know like making that personal connection right keeping the human aspect in it um where it's not this abstract idea um but they can actually like see themselves in your shoes when, exactly. it, when some people don't do when some people's lives are not like that they honestly can't fathom that um somebody wouldn't be without health care but we know that in our community so many, even with the Affordable Care Act, are still un, uninsured, right? And so um, that's why PWN advocates for that single payer model. So that yes. everyone will be covered by insurance, right? Yes. Um, so what is, what is difficult about advocating for healthcare and, and how do you move 
beyond that? You know, here in Texas, we don't have Medicaid expansion uh, and it is really difficult. And even though I'll use uh, a family member that I recently lost, he went from uh, being able to be, to get disability, but in the, in the process of it, he lost his Medicaid. So he was without insurance because Medicare here in Texas does not kick in for two years. So he was in and out of the emergency rooms. And by the time he got to a county hospital, it was too late for him. So he passed. I mean, it was nothing they could do because that is a hard feeling to lose somebody that you love and to see the struggle of not having insurance and it's nothing you can do to help them or you know you can guide them to the county but by the time you get in the county if uh say for example that this is a uh, life or death at that very moment of you getting care you know it's it's really heartbreaking yeah and i totally agree with that i do thank you so much um thank you thank you thank you and um, before we move on, does anyone have any questions for Tana? Or Tana, do you yourself have anything that you want to add? You know, the way I look at it as being an advocate, but also being a mother, is that we are the last ones to go to the doctor. Mm -hmm. And, you know, health care is a human right for everyone. So that's the last thing I have to say. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tana. Thank you for sharing your story and just thank you for being an inspiration to so many, so many, you know. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, <laughs> and now we're going to move the conversation over to um, Roxy. Roxy, if you are ready, you can come off mute. Uh, and I'll give you an opportunity to introduce yourself, um, where you're coming in, calling in from. Hello, everybody. My name is Roxanne Glapion, and I am one of the founding members of the sister chapter of Houston, which is in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Thank you, thank you so much for that. Um, we're gonna do the same questions for you. Roxy, how do you actually start a conversation um, about healthcare? Um, like Tana said, it depends on the area of people that I'm around. Um, let's say, for example, if I'm in a setting of like peers, you know, the conversation will just normally flow. Now, if I'm in a setting, say, for example, with my mom and her friends over in the apartments where she lived, which is the senior living, you know, they always talking about how they need to go to the doctor and this hurts and that hurts. And, you know, I'll ask them, you know, well, what kind of medical coverage do you have? You know, do you have access to go and see a specialist if you need to go and see one and if they say that they don't then a lot of times I'll sit there and I'll research other options for them so that they'll know that there are other options out there available for them or even you know give them the number or help them call whoever their insurance provider is to find out if the other access to doctors that they need is available and covered under the plans that they have. Gotcha. Gotcha. So when you come into situations where you're, you're meeting someone, right, and you want to have this conversation about health care, are there any parts of your story that you choose to emphasize when you're trying to stress the importance of having um, health care access? That still goes back to the, situ to the uh, group of people that I'm around. Um, because I have so many different health issues that's going on. Sometimes I'm able to relate some things that I have going on with myself to something similar that someone else has going on. And then other times, you know, what I have going on is totally not relatable to them at all. Mm -hmm. So if it is relatable, then yes, I will definitely share my personal experience on, you know, dealing with the Medicaid system and trying to find someone within the network who will accept my Medicaid for me to go and see the specialist that I need to be able to go see 
to get the necessary tests that I need to have done in order for me to sustain my life. Right. Right. And when you're talking with, um, when you're advocating for um, health care issues um, in your community with legislators, do you ever have a specific ask? Definitely. First thing that I want to know is, what is your stand on making sure that African American women, women in general, but specifically African American women, will have access to affordable health care. Where do you stand on that? How can you ensure that that will in fact happen? Mm -hmm. With your potential plan that you have in place to fight and advocate for that to in fact happen. Right, right. And and that's that's actually good, you know, especially knowing that the uh, mortality rate and the maternal mortality rate um, the, uh, in black women versus any other race here in the United States. Uh, so yes, and, and Kelly is right in the chat, hold their feet to the fire. Um, and so what would you add, especially when you are talking to these elected officials? To not just keep um, low income marginalized women in their radar to also keep the senior citizens in their radar as well. Gotcha. Yeah. Because, not, because, for example, my mother, she'll be 70 years old this year. She cannot get Medicare. She would have to buy into it because in New Orleans, we worked at a state hospital. So the points that you need to be able to acquire Medicare, neither one of us qualify for because we worked for the state hospital. So we paid into a private retirement system. So all of those years that my mom, the 28 years that my mom worked at that state hospital, <clears throat> excuse me, it's like they never existed when it comes down to her being able to get Medicare. Wow. And that's what I was, we were talking about in the beginning, you know, like how the healthcare system is so fragmented, the insurance system is so fragmented and, and on purpose, right? Um, and when you think that you've paid into a system that's going to take care of you, it actually doesn't, you know? Um, and so if you're not rich, then you can't afford to be healthy, right? You can't even figure out what's wrong. You can't eat healthy. You can't go to the doctor. Uh, and so that's actually like moving into my next question. What, what makes it difficult um, to do this type of advocacy and how do you move beyond it? What makes it difficult is the number of brick walls that you seem to constantly hit. Um, it's like well, as soon as you think you're getting over one hurdle and you're getting information to be able to take the next step forward, you end up hitting another brick wall because what you thought or what you assumed you understood really was not what the situation was at all. Like, for example, my mom gets limited Medicaid. I had never heard of limited Medicaid before until I went through the process of trying to get her Medicaid here in Dallas. Gotcha. It will send somebody out to help clean her house, but she can't get assistance with her medications. She can clean her own house. She needs the assistance with her medicine. <laughs> So, you know, it's like, like I said, it's like every time you think you're taking one step forward, you're hitting another brick wall that you have to find another way to get around or consistently chip at to get through it. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Thank you so much. Thank you, Antenna, both. Um, and before I pass it on to Nana, you know, like in, in putting together this webinar, you know, it just really made me think about like my own journey um, in the healthcare system, right? Um, and as a child, like I didn't, I, I didn't think about like, I never wasn't going to be able to go to the doctor uh, because as a child, like that was never an issue. Uh, we, I lived um, at or probably below the federal poverty level. And so like I grew up on Medicaid. So going to the doctor wasn't an issue. I never heard my mom have to, worry about paying a hospital bill or anything like that versus like paying the rent. Uh, so I didn't know like how serious 
not having health care was until I aged out of like Medicaid, right? And um, had to live on my own as an adult. And then it became like really real, like, okay, am I going to actually try to see what's wrong with me or will I like forego paying the rent because I know that I'm not covered and then there's going to be this huge bill for something that's really, really minor, right? Because um, not only is healthcare fragmented over here, but it, it's so expensive, right? And so um, uh, it, it kept me in poverty. So there were, there were times when I really had to make the decision on whether I was going to see what was wrong with me or try to battle it out. And I didn't go to the doctor. I did not go to the doctor, right? And so like, honestly, in my situation, like having HIV was almost like a godsend being diagnosed with HIV, right? It introduced me to the Ryan White program um, and around uh, not too long, like after, I, after the Affordable Care Act went it through, I was diagnosed with HIV, um, you know, and now like I have insurance through my job, right? So there has definitely been a journey, but even with that, like it's still not the perfect system um, because I can, I can see that, you know, like medicines go off the formulary that were fine last year, right? And, you know, like it, the insurance company is not required to have it in big, bold letters. Like, hey, this is changing. You might want to prepare for it. Like, they don't do that. But they, they are able to, like, change things, like, from one year to the next. And so as a consumer, like, that really hurt it really made me question like this whole healthcare system and so i understand and it made me want to dig even deeper into what uh into what uh single payer is right and i felt so freaking late to the party i really did so um i'm just glad that you know even when we at pwn staff are, are not up to what's going on like we have our base who are who are actually advocating on behalf of everyone right and it's not easy it is not easy um we have tana who's um who's um in the um, spokesperson group and we have roxy who's in the uh um uh, god my brain just left me um besides being um one of our coaches graduate yes you know like my, if we have like huge we have like great advocates like y'all and y'all just constantly inspire me and um, I'm, that's enough for me. Um, I'm going to pass it on over to Nana. Um, next slide, uh, Barb. So she, Nana's going to actually talk to us about what it means to be a healthcare voter. Uh, and take it away, Nana, whenever you're ready. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much to Tiami, Barb, Tana, Roxy for what's already been a really powerful presentation. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about how we can apply all of this great um, analysis and our outrage at the system that is broken and failing people, you know, a system that basically makes it better in some ways in terms of accessing healthcare to be a person living with HIV than a person who's not living with HIV, which is completely whack, um, you know, and is really out of step with the way many other countries that see themselves as high income countries uh, take care of their people. And so we're in this, um, you know, we're in a, an election cycle year where there's a lot of attention to this issue and polls consistently show that healthcare is actually the issue on top of minds for most voters. Um, you know, like 21% of voters when polled are saying that healthcare is their top issue. Um, uh, you know, along with issues like climate change and other things, but healthcare is definitely the top of people's minds. And we know that at Positive Women's Network for our base, um, women and trans folks living with HIV and our allies, family members, friends, community members, this is a top issue, it's life or death for us. So um, just thinking about what it means to be a healthcare voter in this election cycle, we have a few recommendations and some of this has already come up on the chat box a bit. So, um, you know, number one, we're obviously we have a presidential race at the top of the ticket. So we want to encourage folks to really pay attention to what the presidential candidates are saying and look at what's included in their healthcare platforms. And that is unfortunately getting easier and easier to do as the number of um, candidates is um, getting smaller and smaller 
and whiter and whiter and more and more male, um, there are only a couple of proposals to really look at and compare right now. Um, and so we'll be comparing, you know, not only, not only do you want to look at what the Democratic candidates are saying, but also what, is the, what are the Republican candidates saying and any other um, parties that might be on the ticket. What are they saying about health care? What's their commitment to health care? Um, and then also, uh, there will be a lot of members of Congress on, who are up for re-election this year as well in both the House and the Senate. Many of them have um, already been, um, have already, you know, cast votes on healthcare issues. So the, um, you know, there have been three attempts already in the last couple of years to repeal the Affordable Care Act. And there have been other votes relevant to healthcare as well. But if you just look at um, Affordable Care Act repeal, for example, you can see how your members of Congress voted on that in the past. Did they vote to take away healthcare? Um, or did they vote to um, maintain the current um, system of health care, which the Affordable Care Act was a huge step forward in terms of protecting people with uh, disab disabilities, pre-existing conditions, um, LGBTQ folks, etc. So you can see all of that data. Um, at the state level, there are a lot of health care issues as well. So for example, um, you know, some states have chosen to expand Medicaid and others haven't. And that's another thing that you can look at and say uh, and see whether your uh, governor had any role in that decision making process. Um, there have been some states that have put forward proposals to create um, work requirements for the Medicaid program. You can also look at how state elected officials have handled that in the past. Um, and you can be attending candidate forums, especially for members of Congress who might be running, and ask them direct questions to get them on record about their commitments to health care. Um, that is a totally legal thing to do, even for, for a nonprofit organization, to ask uh, pointed questions about what they will do to you know, protect health care for people living with HIV, for people with pre-existing conditions, for people with disabilities. Um, to Tana's points earlier, what will they do to protect choice, um, reproductive choice for folks? Um, so the, the questions that you ask for um, federal or national candidates are going to be different from the questions you ask for state level candidates because the types of things that they can influence are a bit different. But we know that um, the administration has, for example, already um, said they're planning to come for the Affordable Care Act again as soon as they can. Um, the Supreme Court is looking at a case on, on the Affordable Care Act as well right now. So <clears throat> you can be asking questions about whether they would support um, the, you know, maintaining the Affordable Care Act. Will they support protecting LGBTQ people from discrimination in healthcare settings, et cetera? Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, and then, of course, you know, as, as Tana is saying in the chat box, yes, take the pledge to vote. So we have a, a pledge that I think went out. Um, we can put the link in the chat box as well here. Um, take the pledge to be a healthcare voter in 2020. We'll be following up with everybody who signs that pledge. Um, with additional information throughout the election cycle about ways they can get involved. And reach out to you know, at least 20 people in your personal network between now and November to talk to them about voting. Um, you know, so make a list of 20 folks in your personal network. This doesn't have to be through work or even community organizing. It can be friends, it can be family. Um, but ask them to commit to uh, not just vote in November, but to vote to protect your healthcare. Um, all of our healthcare because our lives depend on it. So we can um, put the link to the vote pledge in the chat box for all of you. And um, yeah, these are just a few things you can do. I'd love to hear ideas from other folks about ways that you think we can elevate healthcare issues during this election cycle and amplify them. So if folks wanna chime in on the chat box at all with your ideas, that's great. And I will, with that, turn it back to Tiami. All right. Well, thank you so much, Nana. Um, and see, on the next slide, we have what the actual uh, pledge to be a healthcare voter looks like. Um, if you have your phones out, you can actually click on that scan code. 
um, and it'll take you right to it, right? Um, but I also put it in the chat here, um, the loan code, so that um, you guys can go ahead and feel free to have it up on whatever device that you're on at your leisure. Next slide. Um, at this point, we're going to open it up for Q and A, um, and I don't see any in the actual box. So let me go back over to the chat and make sure that I haven't missed anything. Tell me, it looks like we've got Jeanette who's talked about putting out registration boxes. And Tana, who's talking about showing up at forums and asking questions and asking the question. Right, the question. Yeah, the question. <laughs> and so not sure if we want to, you know, um, if there aren't questions, hear more a little bit about what that looks like. And, and maybe even have Tana tell us about what it's been been like to, to actually go to a, to a forum mm -hmm. and, and ask a question. Because I think that's something that is, um, you know, could be pretty intimidating, right? Right. You know, uh, this is Tana. Uh, here in Houston, we went to the DA forum. And, you know, uh, the way they had it set up, you had to put your questions in a basket. And great for us that one of our questions got asked. But if you are going to go to a forum and one thing that i've learned is don't sit together be spread out but have your questions ready before you get to that forum to ask that question and you ask them directly what are you what is your values on the issue that you are asking say for example hiv criminalization say for example health care Make sure your ask is very clear and make sure that you don't give up when you asking them the question. Stand there until they answer that question and your question will be answered. Kelly is saying what you're saying is so helpful, but why is it useful to actually spread out um, when you go to a forum in a group? Uh, for one, uh, it doesn't look like they're being attacked. Uh, uh, you're attacking them. So, you know, like we had on our t-shirts, but we were still, some of us were still together, but then other people in our group was on the opposite end but you don't never want uh, the person that you're asking the question to to feel like you are attacking them. And so when they see like with the same shirt on, right? People with the same shirt on, then they could be like somewhat intimidating to them. Yeah. Okay. You don't, yeah. Okay, got you. And Barb says that they always bring extra index cards with questions already on it. Yeah, much along the lines of what Tana was like saying, have your questions already ready by the time you get there. Uh, yeah, any any other questions or comments? I'm gonna switch switch gears and go over here and check out Facebook real quick. Okay, I see that we have some people on the Facebook Live. So, hey, y'all, since I'm talking, y'all can see me. Okay. <laughs> and Barb asks, are people ready to healthcare rumble? Yes, we're ready to rumble. Um, I tried to go to the Bernie Sanders uh, when he when he came here to speak in Dallas, I couldn't get in, but there were so many people out there, and a lot of the discussions that people were having were actually about healthcare. And to piggyback off what Tanner was saying about making sure that you spread out, sometimes they'll have like different microphones in different places throughout the uh, 
throughout the town hall meeting or, you know, the general consensus. And if you're spread out, then you may also have a bigger chance on at least one or two of your questions being answered if you have people in multiple places where they have multiple microphone stands. So be strategic in, in where you sit. Got you. Very. And if you have all of your questions together and you're, you're a unit and you're close to a microphone, you know, that's the strategic takeover of the microphone. One here, one there, one there, one there. I got you. Makes sense. I also went to go to Michael Bloomberg, but he pulled out of the race an hour before he was supposed to come and speak to people here in Dallas. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you both. Um, Cheryl Lamb asked, like, what about town halls? And Cheryl, if you want to go into a little more detail, are you saying, like, are they a different setup than um, a forum? Hang on just a second. I'm going to promote Cheryl so that she can ask her question. Okay. Cheryl, you should be able to ask your question now if you'd like to, or if you want just had a point, a tip or trick that you wanted to share. Yeah, I was just wondering whether or not um, town, where, whether or not it was good to go to town halls. I think maybe that's what you guys were talking about as far as forums. So, am I right? I usually at town halls, I show up alone. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, is is that a good way to go? Also, and they're usually a lot smaller. Let me say this. This is Tana again. Town halls are fantastic to ask your questions, most definitely. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, Cheryl, I'll tell you that I go, I go to just about anything I can um, because, you know, especially when we're talking about um, the elections, but more importantly, moving beyond the elections. You know, if they've seen me at events and town halls and things like that ahead of, of when they get elected, if they do, then they know that I'm someone who's going to hold them accountable to things that they've said and that I'm going to remember because I've been there as well. So it's sort of a long term goal to be able to make sure that we uh, can hold them accountable as well. Thank you very much. Yeah, of course. Anyone else uh, want to come off of mute and ask their question? All right. Tiani, Barb, I don't have a question. I have a statement. Um, okay, go ahead, Roxy. It was something that Tiami was saying that when you're a child, you don't think about having access to health care. For me, as a grandparent and being involved in what we're doing right now with Organizing for Power 2020 and focusing on healthcare. I try to have conversations with my grandchildren on a generalized level that they can understand that healthcare is something that's also going to affect them in the future. So it's not just something that we're fighting for for us right now in this generation. It's also something that's going to be a continuing fight for the next generation and each generation to come after that. Thank you, thank you. That moves us into our next slide, like any last thoughts? And we actually have a quote from you, Tana, and I don't want to uh, read it when I have you here. So yeah, you can come off mute. Hey. If healthcare for all isn't on your radar, I need to know why. And that is so true. Y'all, healthcare is important to my grandkids, to me, to the seniors, to everybody. It is. Yeah. And again, I just want to say that, you know, I, I want to thank Kelly and I want to thank Brianna, um, our policy department, you know, because like, the policy 101 webinar on universal health care actually like it just broke it down a little more for me um, and I'm in the communications and the training department right and so I touch on other departments but like that right there broke it down for me and it made it made clear like the need for 
um, a single payer system here in the United States. Um, it's our, our health care system is shit. Like it really is. And insurance um, is for shit. Like, you know, even when you have insurance, you're not guaranteed um, to like be able to go to the doctor or to get your needs met when you, when you actually have to, right? Um, and so um, having an opportunity for everyone, everyone to be on the same level of coverage, like no matter, regardless of whether you are a person who identifies as trans, like there are no exclusions, right? Um, regardless of like how far away from the doctor, there's something set in place to get you there, right? Uh, and, and like the mental aspect, like everything is taken care of. And by, for everybody, can you just really envision that? Can, can you really envision that? Like people won't, won't end up homeless because they have these exorbitant hospital bills, right? Um, they, they're not going broke. They're not filing bankruptcy. Like they can actually like try to work on having a piece of the American dream, right? And that healthcare is a human right. At the, at the minimum, we should be able to go to the doctor when we need to, right? Um, so thank you again to our policy department. Thank you to PWN um, for actually listening to our members and, and, and being led like by our constituency, right? Um, healthcare is important to you guys. So it's important to us as well. Um, and thank y'all for like having those courageous conversations to where um, you guys put, put it on our, on, our, on our radar that this is what's important to you guys. So I just want to say thank you to everyone um, who was here before me and those who are going to be here after me. Um, yeah. And Barb, I'll pass it on to you. Great. So I actually, um, you know, Crystal had a great question in the chat box, and I just want to make sure we bring that forward because it really is important. Crystal said, you know, there's so many people who are suffering in silence who are afraid to share their healthcare experiences their debts, their challenges. Um, and, and, and I think that that is, you know, very powerful. And she's saying, how do we start our people or people, our people to, to share these stories? And hopefully this um, webinar today, today where we kind of break down a little bit of the history, but more importantly, where we hear from members about how they talk about it in their everyday life, how they're gonna include it in part of their National Women and Girls presentations, how we can go and ask people to be healthcare voters. Um, that, that, is, that that is definitely something that we are trying to break down that, that challenge around people not knowing how to take it from their brain and the policy part to their heart and their lived experience. And mm -hmm. I think that part of it also mm -hmm. is that there's um, a lot of stigma and a lot of shame that goes into people who aren't able to access healthcare and that's part of the conversations that I have is that um, if your healthcare system has not served you well, this is not your, your problem. This is the systemic problem. And, and, and we need to address the systemic challenges that leave people without care, that this is not a failing of you being an, an, an incredible mother or father or, or person, but this is you know, the challenges of the system that make it, you know, practically impossible to have quality care that's affordable. And, and so that's the kind of conversations, hopefully that we'll be able to go ahead and you know, break down and to have around kind of all of our policy issues. And how, do we, how, do we how do we operationalize them and think about them from our own perspective? So Crystal, thank you for that great last thought about you know, sort of a message because that's the ask that we have everybody here is that you go out now and, and practice having these conversations and that you ask people to sign up to be a healthcare voter either at the you know, link that we have or that QR code that you can include if you would like to, um, especially for National Women and Girls Day, but really beyond that you um, continue to shine a bright light and a focus on how access to healthcare and the demand for universal healthcare is something that you are really um, going to be focusing on in this upcoming year. So with that, thank you all so much for joining us today. We're gonna to go ahead and- Thank you.
Sorry. Thank y'all you. for having me. Of course. Y'all have a blessed joining. night. You Thank too. You. Yeah, Great. I appreciate it. Great. Wonderful. Thank you, Tana. Thank you, Roxy, for your presentation. Tiami. Thank, thank you, you Nana. Facilitating Nana, thank you as always for just being so incredible. And thank, thank you, you everybody Kelly. for joining us. Yeah. <laughs> thank you all. And have a great evening. Have a have a great evening and thank you everyone. <laughs>